So, uh, Mr. Joydeep Mukherjee, I mean, we know him as an ace tennis player and uh, somebody who's uh, represented India. Please be seated, gentlemen, uh, with great distinction. Uh, but he also has another aspect of his life, which is he is the grandson of Deshbundu Chitaranjan Das. So, this session happened uh, serendipitously. A small gap formed in our, uh, in our schedule. And uh, this book really had won my heart when I'd gone through it in November. And sadly, this person who was supposed to come and talk to him about the book couldn't make it. So when this gap formed, I think it was just that, uh, you know, we needed to know about the life and the, the contribution of Rash Bihari Bose. And uh, in, a, in a venue like this, which is so evocative when you're talking about the freedom struggle, because it is in a way everything that these men and women struggled against. And it is also in a way a place we have taken and defined as our own. So I would like to hear from Joydeep Da about uh, his, this book and uh, a few words about why he brought it to our attention. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Malvika for inviting me here today. It's lovely to be here on a sunny afternoon in Kolkata with you guys. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not much of a reader, as you know, a, a sportsman, but I'll... I, hello. As I said earlier, I'm not much of a... Okay. Hello. As I said earlier, I'm not much into reading, but I have read this book which is written by Prosen Roy, a young man who I've been known for a few years. He's done a lot of work on this book and research. And uh, I didn't know, and I, I haven't read the full book, but I was going through the book, and a lot of uh, things I didn't know about the freedom struggle, about other people instead of, we all know Netaji Shubhas Bose, his birthday is day after tomorrow. But this gentleman, Ashbari Bose's contribution has been also very big in our freedom struggle. So without much ado, I would like to say thank, to, thank you, Malvika, for inviting me to the launch. It's a pleasure being here. And Prasun, I wish you all the very best with the book. I know it will be a great success. It's a must read for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Joydeep Da. Uh, Joydeep Da was entering when Gayatri was leaving. And when I told Gayatri Di that this is Joydeep Mukherjee, she said, of course, I remember him. And uh, also mentioned that he was rather good looking and still is actually. So uh, thank you so much for that. He's going to be writing his own memoirs, which will be coming out shortly about tennis, about life in the 60s, and about swinging Calcutta back then. So coming back to your book, uh, A Samurai Dream of Azad Hind, what made you choose the figure of Rash Bihari Bose to you know, delve into and to bring out an aspect of Indians, India's freedom struggle that is not spoken of as much as it should be? Yes, and uh, thank you, Malvika, ma'am, for inviting me over here today at the uh, uh, Tata Steel Kolkata Literary Meet. Today is it even more sentimental for me because today happens to be the death anniversary, 78th death anniversary of Sri Rajbhari Bose. And uh, this session is happening today. And it's, it's a wonderful coincidence. You know, when I was researching about writing upon somebody from our freedom struggle movement, and I came upon Sri Rajbihari Bose and his journey. This is the story of one extraordinary man who had one dream from the age of 10 years. 
from the age 10 he had dreamt of fighting for the freedom of his country through armed revolution. He wanted to join the British Army at that young age. And that dream, he carried it forward throughout his life from India and from Japan, where he was self-exiled for the rest of his life. He didn't spare even a moment to give us the Azan Thind where we live today. So I think he deserves a place among the top four people who had fought for our independence. And unfortunately, due to various reasons, Rashbihari Bosch has been forgotten from public memory. Even though his name doesn't find much space in our history books, I think today's generation can give him a place in their hearts, at least, because his legacy is not an ordinary one. He's the man who created the world's first voluntary army for independence of India. He had shown that an organized armed revolution can lead to the freedom of a nation. So his contributions were not small, but it's not there in the public memory. So my intention was to bring his life, his journey, from a firebrand revolutionary to a global leader. How he had covered that journey in one life and then gave us the Azad Hind Forge with Nechaji Shubhash Chandra Bose. That is something which is extraordinary and we all need to know about it. So just to wind back a little, you mentioned that uh, he is, uh, he, he started life in India and then he, he moved all over the world. So first, can you tell us what led to him leaving India? You said exile. So what were the early years? What were the incidents that precipitated his going to Japan? So Rajbiari Bose's life begins at that age of 10 years, like I said, when he was in uh, Chandanagar. Over there in school, he used to, you know, fight uh, with the English teachers who uh, used to abuse the Indian students. From there, his journey started. Then he went on to various places across the country because his father wanted him to be away from this revolutionary world. But he was somebody who was always attracted towards it. So his father tried to take him out from Chandanagar. He took him to Kolkata. In Kolkata, he was enrolled at the Morton School, which is now the Hindu school. There he left it. The Anushinal Shamiti was getting created at that time. He got influenced by Baha Jatin. Then his father took him to Shimla, where he was working in the Shimla press. But again, he started to speak against the British. So that's how he moved from Kolkata to Shimla. Then he went to Dehradun. He was working at the Forest Research Institute over there and staying at the house of Raja Prafulonath Thakur. And from there, he executed a plan to bomb the Viceroy when the capital of British India was getting shifted from Kolkata to Delhi. That was a major act of, you know, something which the British couldn't tolerate. But he didn't stop himself. He continued to do something to revolt. Then there was the Gadar Revolution which happened. The Gadar Revolution started off in India. It started across the world in Canada, in America, in India, in Southeast Asia, all together. And when the main Gadar Party members came to India, they needed one leader. And Rashbihari Bose became that leader who had you know, the power to convince 26 regiments of the British Indian Army during World War I to revolt against the British Army. And that revolution was unfortunately crushed because of a traitor. That time, Rajbari's name was in the top list of wanted criminals for the British. So he didn't have any other option but to leave the country. And that is when he ran away to Japan where he lived for the rest of his life. He couldn't return, he couldn't travel the rest of the world where the British had an influence. So only the Southeast Asia, primarily based out of Japan, he had to stay. After his marriage, he had to change his residence 17 times. And even after he became a Japanese citizen, there were five kidnapping attempts which happened by the British spies to kill him. But despite all that, he could create 
the INA, which we all know, later on became the Azad Hind Forge uh, with Netaji. So you mentioned that, you know, he led this, uh, it was almost like a cat and mouse game where he kept moving, then he had to escape British, I mean, any, any British uh, dominion, and that is why he went to uh, Japan. In Japan, he, he spent the rest of his time there. So have Indians, you know, for instance, we keep talking about Netaji's, uh, you know, shrine, and there's a desire to memorialize him in Japan. Is there anything to memorialize Raj Bihari Bose there? Raj Bihari Bose is a very, very, you know, revered figure in the Japanese society. During my uh, book launch, the Consul General of uh, Japan in Kolkata, he attended the session. And Rashbiri Bose is regarded by the Japanese as a very honorable Japanese citizen. You know, when uh, one of uh, Rabindranath Thakur's uh, teachers at, from Shanti Niketan was visiting Japan, the Japanese told him that you go to Japan and learn Japanese etiquette from Rashbiri Bose. So that was the kind of reverence which he commanded amongst the Japanese society. And when the World War II happened, the, we all know that the Japanese are a very, very, they are hard-headed and stubborn in their decisions. But Rajpiri Bose could manage to convince their imperial general headquarters, the military headquarters of Japan, to allow him and, you know, convene all the prisoners of war in Malaysia, in Malay, in Singapore, in Bangkok, in Japan, to form this army. So they respected what he said, and they gave that army an equal status as the Japanese army's equivalent, not a pet army that would work for the Japanese army. So he still commands uh, a lot of respect. When he died, the imperial coach was sent by the uh, Japanese emperor to uh, take him to his funeral. So there, I think they have a lot of respect that Rajbiri Bose had commanded and still commands to this day. You mentioned that, uh, you know, Tagore, when he went, he was told this. So uh, can you talk us through some of his interactions with the, the luminaries of the time, the great Indians who were his contemporaries? Uh, Rajbiri Bose was uh, in touch with most of the, you know, uh, personalities of that era. In uh, the era of Rabindranath Thakur, in 1924, when uh, Rabindranath visited Japan, he went to meet Rajbiri Bose at his house also. And after Rabindranath came back to Kolkata, to Shanti Niketan, he heard about the earthquake which happened at that time. And Rajbiri Bose's house was completely, uh, it was totally broken off, demolished. Rabindranath sent 500 or 600 rupees of that time to help him out at that era. There was uh, a lot of interaction which happened with Nechaji Shubhas Chandra Bose also, mostly over phone calls, because letters were intercepted. There were letters, if you see my book, there is a letter in which uh, Rajbiri Bose had written to Nitaji that uh, the Congress is a evolutionary body now, it should become a revolutionary body. So there was a statement in that letter, but that letter was intercepted by the British uh, uh, at that era. So most communications happened over phone calls, over messages. There was, there was a shop in the new market area of our uh, Kolkata, where the letters and communications of Rajbiri Bose used to come via different people. That was a ration shop over there. And from there, the letters used to get distributed across. So he had written letter through many people and sent to even Netaji to invite him to leave the country because the country was becoming like a big prison for him. And he couldn't do what he wanted to do. So he invited uh, Netaji Shubhas Chandra Bose to get out of the country at that time through his communications. I then also wanted to find out about the writing of this book. You mentioned that uh, you know we don't uh, we don't celebrate the life of Raj Bihari Bose as much as we should. Uh, the the implication of that is there wouldn't be as much source material about him as one would find if one were dealing with a more uh, 
a life that was more documented. So what were the resource areas and the research uh, material that you used to write this book? So when I wrote this book uh, at that time, it's true, there's very less materials available uh, all across. So from the National Archives, from the National Library, there are documents, there are books which are not into publication as of now, but there are one or two copies available of all these books over there. So using those secondary materials, using certain reports that have been quoted, if you go to the National Archives, they have the British reports of all those attacks which happened at that time. The attack on Lord Harding, that uh, entire police report by the CID of British India Police is there in the National Archives. So you can read and you can get the entire scenario of what had happened at that time. So I collated all that information together and formed the storyline of this book. And then this has been written in you know, a fictional narrative of a non-fiction book. So we have taken the liberty of the author to put in dialogues to a situation. The situation did happen in history. There were incidents which had happened, but the communication which took place, we had put in words into the mouth of all these people. For example, there's an incident which has been quoted by Rajbiri Bose's mother-in-law, that the first time when Rajbiri Bose met Shubhas Chandra Bose, it was, a day, it was an evening, they had dinner together, and Rajbiri Bose the, was talking to Shubhash Bose, who had just come to Tokyo at that time. And after they finished, Rajbiri Bose said that it is now your turn to take on the reins of the presidentship of the INA, because my health is failing, I cannot take it up. This entire organization needs a magnanimous leader who would take them to war. I cannot do that. I am a master organizer. I can always guide you now. But the main work you have to take forward. And there were tears in both of their eyes, and they embraced each other. So these are small, small incidents which we found, which I found in some of these uh, you know, documents from the National Archives and the library. And we collated them into the incidents and took up the storyline. Uh, is there any part of his family who is left behind in India who kind of carries the torch of this legacy forward? So Raj Bihari Bose's uh, sister and his, uh, because his, uh, uh, stepmother's side of family, I think they exist over uh, in Bengal also. And his own children, his son actually uh, passed away during the World War II. He uh, was not inducted into the INA. He fought for the Japanese army as a pilot over there. So he got killed during that. His, he was married to a Japanese person. Yes, lady. he was yes. married to a Japanese lady. And Raj that, that, Bihari. Yes. yes, and that is also a very fascinating story. Like when he, when he uh, ran away to Japan, he had to uh, take refuge because the British were all searching for him. And at that time, he was given shelter by somebody called uh, Mr. Iso Soma, who was the owner of a bakery over there called the Nakamuraya Bakery. So he used to hide in the cellar of their house and they protected him until he got amnesty and then they married their daughter to Rajveri Bose and that's how he became a citizen. So his wife was called the living flesh shield of the Indian in exile by the British newspapers at that time. So that Nakamura breakery also has another uh, you know connection with India because Rajbiri Bose created something called an Indo curry over there, which is the chicken and rice curry, which still sells about millions of helpings every year. And that shop still exists at the Shinjuku station of Tokyo. So his daughter was alive and she visited uh, Kolkata a couple of years back. But I think, uh, I, I'm not sure whether she's still uh, alive with us, but she did visit a couple of years back. Uh, you mentioned his uh, meeting with uh, Netaji. So, uh, how would you assess the influence Rash Bihari and his ideas of forming an army of uh, of armed resistance? How do you think they did they influence Netaji at all? Their ideologies were 
always similar. It's not that you can classify Nitaji Shubhash Chandra Bose or Rajbiri Bose as just revolutionary leaders. They were also supporters of non-violent uh, mass movement. But it's that that they don't believe that it could lead us to our freedom alone. So Rajbiri Bose also communicated civil disobedience to the Congress leaders in India. They, he said that at this point of time, don't agree to the dominion status do a civil disobedience from your end and the army the ina is going to lead an armed attack so together it would choke the british from both ends and both rashbiri bose and nitaji knew that the british army depended heavily on our indian soldiers the indian men were fighting for the british and they were dying the british didn't have their own army of that size which could carry on the World War II for them. So if India could be cut off from the British, then they wouldn't be having enough power to carry on this struggle. They would be defeated. So the ideologies were always similar. And the INA was a structure which Rajberry built from scratch right from the year of 1924 he started to form small, small organizations called the Indian Independence League at various places. And then when the World War II unfolded, he asked to give that a million soldiers who are uh, you know, prisoners of war that happened after the fall of Singapore, which was an event in history which marked and showed that the British were not invincible. When Singapore was taken off by Japan, the world understood that the British can also be defeated. And all the Indian soldiers who got captured over there got convinced to join the INA. But there were internal conflicts. The Japanese had their own power to you know, dominate that army. And Rajbiri Bose's health was failing at that time. So Netaji was a more magnanimous leader who came in and took on the reins. So they were always united in their thought process and their planning, I would say. Okay, before I throw it open to audience questions, uh, you know, as I said, it's also discovering, uh, the process of writing a life story is discovering that life. So, uh, what strikes you about the kind of men and women who, who peopled this country back then? And as a young man, I mean, what, what would you say? Would you like to write about other life stories from that era? Yes, uh, I would reveal that to you today because there, the era of 1900 to the 1915, 20, that era gave us a lot of our brave people who had fought selflessly for the uh, freedom of our country. I, I am, I am doing my research on Bhaga Jyotin. I hope I'll be able to get a book about his journey, his struggles, because he was somebody who influenced many, including Rajbiri Bose. Together, they did plan a lot of things, but unfortunately, Bhaga Jyotin uh, was, you know, he got martyred, unfortunately. So yes, there are so many people about whom we don't know, and this generation and the generations to come ahead, even if we don't read about them in our textbooks, we should at least know about them to be proud of who we are. Our history, our background is strong. And we should all be proud of whom we have come from and what we take as a legacy with us. That's a great uh, note to kind of see if there are any questions from the audience. Uh, I can see one gentleman whose hand is shot up there. Are there any mics? Yes, a mic is uh, coming. Just uh, could you just raise your hand again once? Uh, um, thanks for uh, coming up with this particular book. Thank I you. just uh, want to know something more about the contemporaries of his time. I have read the uh, Vikram Sampath book on uh, Veer Savarkar. And uh, he said that uh, Rash Bihari Bose was hugely influenced by Savarkar. 
Can you throw some light on that? See, uh, Savarkar was somebody who uh, Raj Bihari has openly written about. He has written in Japanese newspapers about Savarkar. He believed uh, that uh, some of Savarkar's ideologies were, uh, you know, strong enough to get our men of that time to join the British Army, to learn from the British Army the skills of fighting, and then get back and fight for your own country. So those were the ideologies which he believed in. He was connected through letters, because if you read uh, uh, Vikram Sampad's book or the other books which are available, there were letters which were getting uh, communicated between them also. And he had uh, even asked, uh, there was a meeting in Bombay which happened between uh, Netaji and V. Savarkar, where uh, he had showed a letter from uh, Rashbedi Bose asking him to tell Netaji to go abroad to Germany at that time. So yes, he was connected because if you look at the previous era of the India house getting formed in London where Savarkar was initially there, there was Lala Hardyal at that time. Lala Hardyal was again connected to Rajbihari Bose during the Gadhar movement. So there were internal connections between all these people. The Gadhar party existed not only in 1915, they were there so much alive in Japan and in Canada later on also. When Rajbihari first went to Japan, there were people of the same Gadar party who were there hiding. And they helped him to form his base over there. So these were leaders who were connected and had one ideology, that is the freedom of this country, to throw out the British and the idea of Purna Swaraj, which is complete independence. There's a lady there. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask that you were discussing about the ideological harmony that existed between Raj Bihari Bosch and Nitaji Shubhas Chandra Bosch. But while researching for your book, did you come across any small incident when these two leaders had a little bit of disagreement on some of their ideologies and how did they come up in midway to run the INA? See, when two uh, great leaders are working towards something which is like an independence of your motherland, there would be, uh, you know, small, small such incidents which might happen. For example, uh, when the INA, before uh, uh, Nitaji came, the INA was given uh, a GOC, the general officer in charge, the commander of the army, to somebody called Mohan Singh. And Mohan Singh was trying to, you know, siphon out some of the powers and he was getting influenced by the Japanese to use the INA in the form of a pet Japanese army. And Rajbiri Bose took a strong hand to cut him off. And he was put into house arrest. There were other people, for example, there's a man called Nedhyam Raghavan, who was a part of the Malay National Congress. And he was also a member of the INA the governing body called the Council of Action. <clears throat> and there were a bit of disagreement with the Japanese commander counterpart who was also coordinating with the INA at that time. But when Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose came in, he said that these men command, you know, uh, the loyalty of a lot of other soldiers within the army. So just putting them completely off would be an injustice because those loyalties would shift otherwise. So he got them back. He got back Nedim Raghavan as his treasurer, I believe. And he gave an option to Mohan Singh that you can join, but you have to be curtailed in your powers. So these were small disagreements which got sorted out and for the better, I would say. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for answering. <coughs> uh, we can take one more question. There's one right in front. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, sir. Your passion uh, is evident. Uh, just to uh, be with you on the subject matter, I yes, have traveled sir. to Japan, Singapore, and also Port Blair in search of the way they were thinking at that time. Being, uh, I stay abroad, so for me, 
a bluff of the country can only be done by understanding what happens over the years by itself. In fact, I was also in the cell of Savarkar, uh, going there and staying for half an hour just to understand what was going on in his mind as he was doing. Just, yes. a, just a thought process. One, yes. I share your things. Now the question is that the, I was trying to understand the Japanese, which were ruthless by, by itself, what prompted them to agree, but then did they slightly slip away from this when their entire scene was going in a, in a, not in a very strong way. They were very reverent of the emperor. So you know what that. Was the, basically right. it's a Japanese role. Yeah, Japanese. that is the question. The Japanese role, I have tried to understand how seriously we should have been taking it. Would you be able to... The throw initially, it? sir, the Japanese, uh, they, they formed the uh, Fujiwara Kikan, F. Kikan, uh, based out of Bangkok and Malay over there. And the Japanese very well understood that curtailing India from Britain was the only way they could win the war. So they had that, you know, uh, internal uh, benefit also by supporting uh, the Indian army. And initially they supplied us with arms, with uh, ammunition, with ration. And in exchange they wanted information about the Southeast Asia's movement over there. And after Rajbari Bose's health was breaking off at that time, then there were incidents where the quality of guns, the quality of food getting supplied to the Indian soldiers were getting degraded day by day. And that is when Netaji Shubhas Chandra Bose came in and he stepped forward and said that, no, this is not happening. You have to give us equal status, equal arms, equal ration, and then only we are going to fight. And we are an army. And you are going to benefit from our army. We are not benefiting from your army. So that was a stance which he had put forward. So I would say the Japanese were trying to manipulate at some point of time. But this handover, this beautiful handover between Rajbari Bose and Netaji Shubhas Chandra Bose, where there was no ego coming into play, that created the magic over there. Great. I think uh, that would whet everyone's appetite to read more about uh, a samurai dream for Azad Hind by, about Raj Bihari Bose. The book is available at the Festival Bookstore. For those who don't know where that is, it's just outside the gate. When you exit, there's a little entrance into Mohar Kunjo on your right. There's a bookstore there. And uh, Prosoon will be signing books there. Do check out his book and indeed the other titles of the authors who are visiting our festival there. Prosoon, what can I say? Thank you so much for showcasing your book here. And all the best for your Bhaga Jyotin enterprise as well. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you so much for inviting me. And today especially because it's the death anniversary of Sri Rajpiri Bose. Thank you everyone for coming and joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you.